is Jamie Buchanan. I'm an orthopaedic surgeon on the south coast in Hastings. And I've been an FRCS ortho examiner for 10 years. I finished my time now. Uh, but during that time, I did completely learn to understand how the exam actually works. And I'm going to try and give you some of that information today. You need to know that prior to the exam, all examiners compulsorily have to attend a brief the night before. And during that time, we are reminded of several things. We're reminded that it's an extremely stressful event for the candidate. You've got an awful lot going on in your lives at this time. Relationships are being formed, children are being born, and on top of that, you've got a difficult and stressful job, and now you're being asked to take a very public exam, which you really do need to pass in order to progress. We appreciate that, we know it's stressful, and we know it's utterly exhausting. The exam also has several parts to it, and it's important to realise that the MCQ really is just testing your very basic knowledge of orthopaedics. And if you've passed the MCQ, we now know that your orthopaedic knowledge is good enough to progress. The next part is the clinicals. And these are divided into two parts. There's the short and intermediate cases, which are effectively an outpatient setting, testing your ability to make a diagnosis, make a plan, interact with the patient, and to have a fairly high level discussion about that problem with a senior colleague. And then come the vivas, which are a series of questions on different topics, once again, testing your ability to have a, a high level discussion of higher order thinking with a senior colleague in a sensible and intelligent fashion. There are 96 different marking episodes to this whole clinical examination. There is no such thing as a trapdoor fail. No single question you can plough so badly that you cannot recover from it. So the marking scheme really runs from four up to eight. Six is a pass. If you get 96 sixes, you will pass. If you get 95 sixes and one five, you fail. Now, you've got to accept the fact that you're going to have one or two disasters along the line. We all do. But I hope by getting a few sevens and eights, you will have enough to compensate such that you will achieve the required pass mark. The examiners are reminded that we're examining as a level as a day one consultant in the generality of orthopaedics. You're not a specialist in bone tumours or paediatric brachial plexus injuries. This is a day one consultant in the generality of orthopaedics. We're reminded to be civil and polite. We're also reminded not to be overly friendly, not to say well done or I agree. We grunt and nod and are largely non-committal in our responses to your questions. So the examiners are pretty deadpan. Do not be put off by that but it's, it's the way that the examiners are expected to behave. Prior to sitting down uh, and starting the examinations, the examiners all sit down together and look at the questions which are to be posed to you. They sit in groups in their particular viva tables and decide on the entry level questions, the pass fail questions and the higher order thinking questions such that there is a general standard agreed upon by the examiners for each of the topics which are going to be discussed. We're looking for a logical thought progression to our level of higher order thinking, a higher plane on a topic, uh, demonstrating that you really are consultant level material. If there is a need to keep returning to base level questions and you have chaotic and disorganized thought process, it really is quite difficult to score well. If you're quick to grasp the problem, fluent in your approach to formulate a diagnosis and a plan, then moving to the higher plane on the topic is easy and you're quickly in the level of scoring seven and eight. And so to the clinicals. In effect, it's an outpatient setting and you can really predict what's going to be there on the day. For the short cases, you know very well that you're going to be getting lumps and bumps, rheumatoid, Dupuytron's disease. You're not going to be seeing people in terrible pain with difficult diagnoses. There are going to be chronic problems with good fit clinical signs. And so you can expect to get the nerve injury, the cartilage capped exostosis. 
In fact, that last diagnosis of the cartilage cap textosis, I will almost guarantee you're going to see at some point on x-ray or in person. And then you come to the intermediate part of the exam. And remember, this is five minutes of taking a history, five minutes of examination, followed by five minutes of discussion. These are relatively short time periods, and you've got to be quite mindful of that. The history needs to be succinct, as you would take in an outpatient setting. And if you feel you want to write some stuff down while taking the history, do so. I mean, if you're seeing a 58-year-old right-handed hairdresser, and at the end of the history, the examiner says, well, summarize what you found, and you've forgotten what her job is, and whether she's left or right-handed, and how old she is, you, do, you don't half look a bit thick. So try very hard to get it accurate, and when you're asked to summarize, be succinct. Don't go through the whole history. Only put down the relevant parts. And if you've seen a 58-year-old with a dislocating right shoulder and she's a hairdresser, you know, the fact that she's diabetic and a Jehovah's Witness probably is important. But all the other bits and pieces which you may glean along the time world, don't feel the need to reiterate that. When it comes to the examination, some candidates seem to spend the vast majority of their five minutes circling the problem, really because they're so intent on... Uh, on inspection before getting down to examination. We're trying to get to a higher level plane here. And if you spend two or three minutes circling a knee, then there's very little time to you actually get a hands-on problem and to look at the ACL or whatever the problem is. You can, you can see what's going to turn up in these uh, cases as well. You know you're going to get a 45-year-old farmer with medial knee osteoarthritis. And then the question is going to be, are you going to do uh, a high tibial osteotomy, a uni, knee, a uni uh, knee replacement, or a total knee replacement, or possibly an arthroscopy, but I suspect that's been done already. Remember, this is a surgical exam, and though it's possible to treat everything non-operatively if you want to, it is a surgical exam, and I say it again, because at some point the examiner is going to want you to consider surgery, whether it's worthwhile, and the risk and benefits. And in this particular case of the uh, medial osteoarthritic in the uh, heavy manual labourer, um, if you can aim, if you are able to provide some form of evidence as to why you would do one form of treatment and not another, uh, that certainly helps uh, you progress to the next level of scoring. The vivas now. This is always very stressful, I know. There are going to be a number of topics given to you. Um, five minutes from each of the, can of the examiners, uh, so that's 15 minutes from one examiner and 15 minutes from another. You will cover three topics with each examiner, and they're looking for an intelligent discussion on a number of topics. You know there is going to be a spinal question along the way, and don't forget that not only in basic sciences but other uh, areas, your knowledge of anatomy will also be discussed. There seems to be a tendency amongst uh, candidates to leave basic sciences till the very last to revise. My advice to you is get on to that early because it's not something which you naturally learn in your uh, hospital life looking at patients, x-rays, outpatients and in the operating theatre. As before, being able to quote relevant literature is always important. And there are always going to be hot topics, depending on what's going on in the press at the time. Metal on metal hips was extremely uh, hot two or three years ago. Deep vein thrombosis, osteoporosis, I'll name, uh, just to name a few. All aspects of bone metabolism are going to come up at some point. And so drugs, conditions, hormones, enzymes, all of these which are involved in bone metabolism, you need to be particularly mindful of. Bone tumours obviously are very examinable, they've got very distinct x-rays, uh, they're distressing topics and some are benign, some are malignant, some are secondaries and you need to be able to have quite a firm grasp on what's going on. Some of my personal uh, things which I find difficult to deal with is when a candidate is determined to refer every single uh, problem to a specialist unit or to a specialist colleague. I think you have to use a bit of humour here and you can say well ideally this patient needs to be managed in a specialist bone tumour unit and then you can say I suspect that's where I'm working today. 
use a bit of humour and the examiner will tell you certain you are. And you can say, well, the principles of this uh, problem are that they need to be looked after by a multidisciplinary team. And then you talk about that team and then you offer an opinion as to how you would go about investigating this patient, diagnosing this patient, and then ultimately its treatment. Listen very carefully to the examiner. Another personal bet noir of mine is when I ask a question such as, how would you investigate this patient? And the, patient reply, the candidate replies, oh, I would take a full history and examination along ATLS protocols. That wasn't the question. I wanted to know what investigations you're going to do next. What are you going to look for in examination is another question. Listen very carefully to the examiner. They're going to give you very distinct pointers. They're wanting to be able to give you seven and eight, but you can't get that if you are returning to base questions yourself without progressing to the fact. Examiner says to you what investigations are going to be required. Um, you can go straight to MRI scan, but to show logical thought progression, it would be more sensible to say that you want some routine hematological and biochemical screens, followed by basic imaging, followed by cross-sectional imaging. And then that just shows the examiner your thinking, how you're going to go about uh, sorting out this particular problem. If you are shown a fractured neck of femur, we all know that it is possible to treat it non-operatively, but I don't think you would do that in a hospital setting. There may be one in a hundred where you may consider a non-operative treatment. But if you see a fractured neck of femur, it's perfectly reasonable to say, this needs operative treatment, and this is what I would do. Remember, it's a surgical exam, and though non-operative treatments are available, if it's not what you would do, don't do it. Go straight for where you think this patient is best going to be sorted out. Hospitals a long time. You're all experienced doctors and you're particularly experienced in the area of orthopedics. Make a diagnosis, formulate a plan, involve colleagues in an intelligent discussion and treat patients with respect and use the appropriate language. The fact that the examination is looking at just these things should come as no surprise to you. There is no doubt that to some performing under these pressures, they find it extremely difficult. And my advice is the only way you can improve is to keep practicing over and over again. Good luck.